Hello and welcome to Parkside Evangelical Church. We welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's a slightly cooler day today. The rain is coming down very gently, but it's very much needed. The fields are all hungry and thirsty for more water and our gardens need that refreshing as well. But you and I need the refreshment that can only come through Jesus Christ. So even though you're not able to join us in our wonderful building here today, we welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus and ask you to lift up your hearts to heaven and receive blessing from God. Psalm 84 is one of those psalms that is so rich in meaning. Originally, it was probably written for the pilgrims as they traveled from throughout the land of Israel and came up to Jerusalem, that each and every one of them longed to meet with God, to worship God in that temple. But that temple's not there anymore. But these words are even more true for us today. They are true because they are blessed by the power of the Spirit of God. And he brings this poetry to life and gives us hope and thirst. Listen to these words. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. For many of us, that really sums up our longing to be in this building. I'm sure that you would far rather be meeting with your friends and sitting alongside all of the people that you know and love in this building. And you are hungering and thirsting just as much as I am to be in the courts of God. That we could together sing his praises and worship him. But more than this, the psalm points us to an even greater longing. The longing to be with the courts of God in heaven. And there to behold him and to worship him. The words carry on. Even a sparrow finds a home. And a swallow a nest for herself. Where she may lay her young. At your altars. O Lord of hosts. My king and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. Ever singing your praise. And that will be our main joy. The same God who cares for sparrows, who takes delight in the swallows, longs to have fellowship with us. And one day that fellowship will be complete and everlasting. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rains also cover it with pools. And so as the pilgrims would travel, sometimes tens, sometimes almost a hundred miles to come to worship God at the temple, they would go through deserts and they would go through difficult and dry times, but they longed to meet with the living God. And it's the same with us. As we make our pilgrimage through the difficulties of this life, we go through those times of difficulty and sorrow and dryness. But we are refreshed by the power of the Holy Spirit in this poetic language, in the place of springs, and with, by those pools of refreshment. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of of your anointed, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favour and honour. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. This is one of my favourite psalms and no wonder it's so rich and wonderful and I've got this lovely recording that I hope that you'll sing along to 
all taken directly from this old version, this metrical version of the Book of Psalms, sung by some Scottish Presbyterians, but nevertheless, these glorious songs have been uniting the saints of God throughout the generations, all the way back to the time of Christ. And for a thousand years before that, we join with the saints of God in that common longing to be with God. And so will you join me as we sing how lovely is thy dwelling place. join me in prayer. Our God and Father, we love you. We praise you and worship you, dear Lord. We thank you for these damp days. It's been such a glorious spell of sunshine. But Lord, we also need these times of refreshing as well. We need you to pour out the rain on the fields, but we also need you to pour out your Holy Spirit in our hearts and our lives to refresh us, to give us strength, to keep going. Because, Lord, we love you. We long to meet with you. We long to experience your power. We long, dear Lord, to meet with Jesus, to gaze upon the face of your anointed and to find glorious refreshment in him. Bless us by the power of your Holy Spirit, dear Lord. Help us to regard this time as we gather in this service as a time of drinking from those life-refreshing pools that the Holy Spirit pours out for us. Oh Lord, please give us strength as we make our pilgrimage through this land. Give us strength, dear Lord, so that we can continue to do all the good things that you call us to do. Give us your love and mercy, dear Lord, but most of all, give us the hope of heaven because, Lord, nothing in this life will satisfy us as much. You said, dear Lord, that at, at one day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. And, Lord, we dwell in the midst of the tents of wickedness at the moment. Dear Lord, we see that corruption all around us. We know that nothing in this life can give us the satisfaction that you can. And so, Lord, please, Refresh us, restore us, and help us as we worship you in these difficult circumstances. Dear Lord, please, by the power of your Holy Spirit, lift up our hearts into heaven so that we may dwell in your courts. Amen. I'm going to sing this new song to you. I'm sure it's uh, new to you. It's lovely words, but it's an old song. It's over 100 years old. But it nevertheless 
captures that sense of anticipation that you and I need. That longing for heaven. That knowledge that we will be with Jesus forever and ever because we were purchased by his blood. calls us to prayer again and again. God knows that he can do anything. He already knows what all the problems are. But nevertheless, our privilege is that he has given us the responsibility to be included in his plan to transform all things. So he listens to our prayers and he takes them seriously. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank you and praise you. We thank you, dear Lord, for providing for us. We thank you and praise you, dear Lord, for all the mercies that you pour out to us. Again and again, we receive your mercy. We receive strength from you. We are provided for. None of us have gone hungry, dear Lord, because you have provided for us. And we thank you and praise you for that, dear Lord. You are good, merciful and kind. We thank you and praise you, dear Lord, that there is no limit to your grace and mercy. But Lord, we do go through those valleys of dryness. We do go through those difficulties and hard times. And we know, dear Lord, that eternity is long, but life is short, but it is painful. It is difficult. It is so heartbreaking. So give us the strength that we need. We lift up to you all of those uh, parents whose children won't be going back. Lord, 
It's hard. It's a very hard time for so many people with children in their house uh, where the children are bored and restless and anxious. Dear Lord, please, please help the parents to overcome. Lord, we pray uh, for our widows. We pray for all those who are lonely, all those who are living by themselves. We pray for those uh, who are in our nursing homes. Dear Lord, please bless them, help them, continue to provide for them, continue to keep them safe from this COVID-19 virus. Oh, Heavenly Father, please pour out your mercy and grace on them. Father, we know that many people are frustrated because they can't have the uh, medical treatment that they would normally have. They've had uh, their, um, their appointments have been delayed. Please, dear Lord, bring them supernatural healing. Bring them relief from the pain that they've been in. We thank you and praise you, dear Lord, for those uh, opportunities where we can go in. We pray for healing and restoration for each and every one of the members of our congregation who are going through these difficult times. Lord, we think of them name by name. We think of them with all of their individual needs. They're known to you and they need your healing and blessing. Have mercy on them. Father, we continue to lift up to you our government. We pray for wisdom for our government. And we just ask that in this difficult time, not just with the COVID-19, but also with the protests that are happening at the moment, please give them wisdom and restraint. Help them, dear Lord, to know what the right thing to do is. Lord, please bring healing to our land. But we know, dear Lord, that there can be no ultimate healing unless we first come to Christ. So long as we are in rebellion against you and against doing things your way, dear Lord, there will always be conflict in our society. There will always be hatred and misunderstanding unless you unify us under Christ. So we pray even more for the revival of your church, that there would be healing and peace and reconciliation in Jesus Christ, that we would have this glorious one thing in common to unite us, that we would be united under Christ. So, Lord, we pray for this video. We pray for like videos. We pray that more and more people would watch them. We pray, dear Lord, that people would be touched and blessed by the message. We pray that there would be that glorious outpouring of revival that only you can give. But we need to repent of our sins, dear Lord. And so we bring our individual sins to you. We recognize that we've sinned against you in thought and word and deed. We haven't done the good things we ought to have done. And Lord, we have failed you in so many ways. Have mercy on us. Bless us. Oh, Heavenly Father, forgive us our sins, for they are many. But we bring them, each and every one of them, to the foot of the cross to receive forgiveness there. We pray for our church our individual congregation, but for all like-minded churches across this land, Lord, have mercy on us. Please forgive us for our corporate sins because we have watered down your word. We have failed to preach the gospel. We have failed to uphold righteousness, justice, morality, decency, and truth. We have failed to be adequate salt and light in this broken world. Please forgive us these many sins but out of that forgiveness, bring revival to your Lord. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, will you sing with me this Sovereign Grace song, All is Well. These, these uh, hymns help us to reflect that, yes, life is difficult, but with God, all things are possible. With God, there can be peace. With God. There is mercy and goodness. The sun beams on behind the clouds And in the dark still grace abounds All is well because of God's great love The road of disappointment runs Where unseen mercies wait for us And all is well Because of God's great
every fear The Lord of comfort draws us near And all is well because of God's great love How brightly shines the whole love of the Father In our Savior Jesus Christ With enjoy doing for your holidays but when I was younger one of the things I loved doing was camping especially camping up in the mountains you trek out for day after day you bring everything on your backpack you would walk and walk and get as far away from everything as possible but of course that was just a holiday it was always nice to get back to a nice warm bed but of course for many people throughout the world the Bedouin just very recently out, out in the deserts of Saudi Arabia had to live in tents. This was more common in the ancient world when the Bible was written. Many people, whether they were poor or rich, whether they were on the move or living on the margins of society, had no other source of protection from the elements, no other place to call home other than tents. Very different for us today. I wonder what type of house that you would love to live in. I'm sure none of us would want to live permanently in a tent. But maybe you've got pictured in your mind the perfect place for you to live. Maybe it's some sweet little cottage out in the country, somewhere with its own garden, somewhere surrounded by hedges and fields, somewhere where you could feel accepted and loved and safe and enjoy all of God's creation. Perhaps for you, you feel like it should be something a little bit more grand and special. Or maybe you've just got a wonderful imagination and you love this more fantasy, a bit like this building. But... Bear those things in mind, bear those pictures in mind as we come to the word of God. This, as we carry on our series, working our way through the um, second letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, 
We've been discovering all the trials and difficulties that he's been through, and yet he's always found this strength, and he's always been able to put everything in perspective because he knows Christ and he knows his future. And so as we face troubles that we are going through at the moment, we need that same source of hope. And that's what we find in this passage. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please bless us and help us. Help us to find the truth that you've placed in your word. Help us to claim these promises. Help them to become real to us. So please bless the reading of your word by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul writes, So we do not lose heart, though our outward self is wasting away. Our inward self is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed. He's speaking there, of course, of our human bodies. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. For in this tent, the tent of our human bodies, we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by what is life. He who has prepared for us this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So... Whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one of us may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. This is a wonderful passage of scripture, an incredibly encouraging one for us. But I want us to think firstly about what the hope of heaven, this passage which is all about the hope of heaven. The hope of heaven helps us firstly to keep things in perspective. I don't know if you ever think about the size of the universe. It's one of those things that we find almost impossible to get our heads around. It is so unbelievably vast. We think about the scale of Little Hampton. Maybe you've travelled further afield, maybe you've travelled through England, maybe you've travelled to Australia, and you know something of the length of time it just takes to get round this globe. A whole day of travel in, in aeroplanes just to get to the other side of the world, and that's incredibly fast compared to all of history. And then you think about the height of the clouds, and above that, the height of the satellites. And as you go further and further out, you get to the moon. And eventually, after a hundred million miles, you get to uh, near the sun. And beyond the sun, you go beyond the planets. And you get to the edge of our solar system. And there, it's a hundred trillion miles away. And you go beyond that, even further. And you start to reach our, uh, the nearest stars. And they are trillions upon trillions of miles away. And beyond those stars... We leave our Milky Way, we leave the galaxy that we're in and we start to come to new galaxies and new stars and each galaxy is made up of trillions upon trillions of stars and we go even further than that. By now we're adding so many noughts before our, after our trillions of miles we just completely lose all sense and further and further we go to the very edges of the observable universe and we give up. We have no idea how to cope with something so vast. Christians are divided. Some Christians believe that the earth is quite young. They take Genesis very seriously. Others take science and say, no, we need to learn from science as well. And they say that the earth and the entire universe is 36 billion years old. 
the um, Bible people who, um, who take the Bible very literally say, no, it's much, much younger than that. But to me, if the universe is 36 billion years old, it is still young. It is young in comparison to God. And even though we can't comprehend how vast our universe is, it is still small in comparison to our God. Because we worship an infinite and eternal God. You and I need to keep the hope of heaven in perspective. And just as we can barely get our heads around how incomprehensibly big this universe is, we can barely get our heads around how incomprehensibly long eternity is. Paul uses some quite shocking language in this passage. It says, we don't lose heart, which is encouraging. And it's encouraging to know that our inward self has been renewed day by day. But in verse 17, he says that this momentary light affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Now, if you're going through a hard time, if you're suffering, if you're in pain, if you're separated from your loved ones because of death, if you are struggling with the aches and pains and the frustrations of old age, if you're dealing with a situation that is way, way beyond your control, there's no comfort in this word as you first come to it and think, this momentary light affliction? Are you kidding? This seems to go on and on and on. There seems to be no end to it. But, yeah, it's hard. It's it can be hard when you're feeling awful. It can be hard even to reach the toilet. It can seem a ridiculously long place to travel to when you're feeling awful. And how short that is in comparison to the size of this earth and the size of this universe. We need to keep these things in perspective. Because Paul has had an experience of God that is so vast. He knows the power of his God is so great. He knows the eternity of his God goes on forever and ever and all time. And he's able to keep his difficulty, his sorrows. These sorrows, which as we'll read more and more of in this letter, are so great. His suffering was so awful and repeated again and again. And yet for him... This was a momentary light affliction because he placed it in the context of eternity. I said at the beginning of this uh, that I used to enjoy going camping and going hiking. And uh, obviously when you're out hiking, you can head off and you can be full of energy. And you can think, yep, we're going to make it. And then you get to the first hill and the first mountain and the first ridge. And then the second and then the third. And then you start to get weary. But... You keep going and you keep going because you know at the campsite at the end of it, it will be worthwhile and you'll be able to rest and relax. And you set up your tent and you sit there and you're surrounded by this beauty. And even though it's been cold and wet and this rain has been pouring down, even though as you've climbed over those ridges and mountain peaks, even though everything has been covered in fog and mist and you haven't seen anything and uh, every part of you is soaked to the skin, reach your destination and you're able to dry out, you're able to reflect on all the exercise you've had, your aches and pains disappear and you can actually enjoy the place, the new place that you've arrived. And how much more so should that be true of us as we put our lives in perspective? It's a tragedy when a child dies, just a few short years. But for those of us that have lived any length of time, where we've had sometimes months, sometimes years of aches and pains and suffering, and it just goes on and on and on. And suddenly, 10 years, 20 years have gone by. For those of us that are, I'm over 50 now, perhaps you're 60, 70, 80 years old. And as you look back on your life, as I look back on mine, it just seems to be accelerating. Every year seems to go faster and faster and faster. And we start to get, uh, uh, the longer we live, the shorter our lives seem to be. Not just in the future, but also as we look past. It seems that our childhood and our youth is so near to us, and yet decades have passed. 
This life is short. And the afflictions that we have, though they are intense and sorrowful, are short in comparison to eternity. We should fear. We should fear being separated from God forever. We should fear standing before the judgment of seat of Christ. We should fear receiving the rewards if we have not repented. We should fear the reality of God judging us. But if we're looking to Jesus and we see him as our only hope, if we're looking for Jesus for our salvation, he has promised that he will go before us and he will prepare for us mansions, mansions of which will never be taken away from us, mansions of glory where we will dwell with him forever and ever. And it will take time for us to understand. It will, our lives here, whether they were cut short in our youth or whether they were a full life of 80, 90, 100 years. Our lives will take all eternity to unpack as we see what God did for us at every single part of our lives. Through every struggle and every t heartache, we will see that it was Jesus working his good purpose out. We will see only then, in all eternity, what it was that he saved us from. There's a lovely old gospel song. I'd like to play a couple of verses of it just at the moment. We will understand it better by and by. And I love this. Uh, it's not very well known in this country. It's an American song. This uh, song I picked up off the internet. Uh, I think I'm allowed to put this in as part of the service. But it is just a wonderful reminder that eternity is long. Life is short. And we will understand it better. Bye and bye. Well then, bye and bye, Lord, when the morning comes. When all the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story of how we've overcome. And we'll understand it better by and by. restless sea of time somber skies and a howling tempest off succeed the bright sunshine in the land of perfect day when the mists have rolled away we will understand it better by and by singing by and by Lord when the morning comes another couple of verses and I'd like to read them to you. Trials dark, 
on every hand and we cannot understand all the ways that God would lead us to that blessed promised land. But he guides us with his eye and we'll follow till we die for we'll understand him better by and by. Temptations, hidden snares often take us unawares and our hearts are made to bleed for some thoughtless word or deed. And we wonder why the test when we try to do our best but we'll understand it better by and by. That hymn really sums up for us this passage that we're looking at. We have the hope of heaven and the hope of heaven helps us to keep everything in perspective. Eternity is long and our trials and suffering in comparison are short and momentary and light compared to the glory that God is preparing for you and for me. But this passage also tells us that the hope of heaven is sustained by the power of God. He who has prepared for us this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. That's why we can be of good courage. God is preparing all of this for us. He is sustaining us. He has filled us with his Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit... He makes these promises real for you and me. He is that guarantee, that experience of God, that thing that connects us to the glory of God in heaven. And he is the one that gives us the strength to endure and to overcome. So he says, we do not lose heart. Though our outward self is wasting away, our inward self is being renewed day by day. If you have a house, you'll know what it's like to have to maintain it. It doesn't just stay beautiful automatically. In fact, if you were to neglect your house for long enough, it would start to fall apart. If you were to abandon your house to the elements, its roof would decay, the windows would break, the paint would peel away, and the doors would rot. And one of the reasons that your house looks as good as it does is because of all of the toil and the work that you've put into it. People need to work hard. This building that we're in, that Parkside, is maintained by the hard work and the sacrifices of so many of you. We live in this world of decay, and unless we're constantly working to uphold things, we can't overcome. And our bodies, how much more true is that of our bodies? Our outward tent, the tent of our bodies, is wasting away, our passage tells us. It's difficult. We struggle. We know the decay. We see it written in the lines on our face. We feel it in the aches and pains of our bones. We feel it in the frustrations and disappointments of life. Everything seems so difficult, but it is the power of God that is strengthening us, that is enabling us to overcome. He is doing the maintenance inside us, and we cooperate and work with him. And as we participate with him, he gives us the strength to overcome. But it's just a tent. A tent takes us on that journey. Maybe a long journey. But it, that tent takes us to our permanent dwelling place. That beautiful house. That mansion of glory that God has prepared for us. In the new heavens and new earth. When Christ returns and makes all things new. And wipes away every tear. And there's no more death. No more pain. And no more suffering. That is what you and I long for. That connection with the living God. Our hope, our joy, our source of all sustaining and glorious peace. That is the work of God. Finally, this passage tells us that the hope of heaven motivates us to live for Christ. It's not just enough to passively lie back and say, well... It's all up to God to do the work. I'm just going to sit here. And if not, nothing happens, then it's all God's fault. No. We have many, many motives to live for God. We have many motives in the, this passage that remind us. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So that each one of us may receive 
what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We look forward, not just to die, not just to go into heaven, not just to the Lord Jesus saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. We look forward to him saying, you are faithful in this, here is your reward. You are faithful in this, here is your greater reward. We're motivated, we don't understand fully what those rewards are. They're sometimes talked about as crowns. You remember the parable of the talents. And in the parable of the talents, uh, the man who gave five talents was given cities. And again, these things are just metaphors. They're ways of pictures of, to try and help us to see that there is something better to look forward to. And it motivates us to go on and say, oh, Lord, I live to please you. I live to keep going for you. Jesus is our ultimate motive, to be with him, to please him. And so we rejoice. We rejoice that we are saved by grace. We rejoice that God's mercy has received us. We, and through that grace, we have access to heaven. Through that grace, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us. Through that grace, the Holy Spirit reveals to us that life is short and eternity is long. Through that grace, we are being renewed day by day. Through that grace, we can trust our God. And through that grace, we need never fear the judgment seat of Christ. We can look forward to those rewards. We can look forward to pleasing our God. We can look forward to being with Jesus forever and ever. I've got one final hymn to sing, Saved by Grace. This is my lovely wife singing again, but another wonderful old hymn that captures for us that longing to be with Jesus, that longing for heaven.
now receive the Lord's benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen. I hope and pray that this was a blessing for you. If you know anybody that needs that reassurance, that comfort of the reality of heaven, please press the like button, make some comments below, uh, um, click the share button, share it on social media, send the links to your friends and to your relatives and neighbours. Let other people know the good news of Jesus Christ. Let others know the hope of heaven. Until next week, may God richly bless you. Amen.